Hi, I'm Sebastian Maida from Penn State University. And this is Lecture 2 of ESC 216, Advanced Field Emission Scanning Electron Microscopy. Okay, so now let's talk about the importance of the detector, its role, and how it actually operates. We've already discussed um, the different types of beam sample interaction, the different types of electrons that we'll, be, we'll detect, specifically secondary and backscattered. Now let's talk about uh, a detector. So the job of an electron detector is of course to gather the electrons, but also it must convert that signal, which is extremely small, typically uh, around picoamps, and um, generate a higher intensity signal around milliamps. This signal can then be further amplified by user control of our contrast knob. And finally, the signal will be resolved as a white, black, or grayscale pixel on some form of a display. And this is usually a computer monitor. So first of all, there are uh, different types of detectors. <coughs> and they're given different names depending upon their location. For example, in-column or in-lens detectors are actually located within the column and they may be used to detect either secondary or backscattered electrons. Another type of detector, an out-of-column detector, is positioned someplace outside the column and is actually only effective for uh, secondary electron detection. The reason is these electrons have lower energies and uh, they're more easily you know, persuaded or pulled uh, towards the detector that's off to the side. The backscattered electrons have such high energies that they're going to go in a straight line uh, wherever they're uh, basically ejected from the, the sample interaction. So here's just a general depiction of a, of a detector and we'll talk about the different components um, because they all have a few shared components. Typically there'll be a grid bias out front right here. Um, or some other means of attracting or repulsing electrons. Then there'll be a scintillator bias, followed by a light guide, a photomultiplier tube, and then some type of photovoltaic uh, and uh, output uh, signal. Um, after this, there could be also another amplifier, and then this will be sent to your display. Um, if you look at an FESEM, you'll actually often see um, this photomultiplier tube and kind of the output signal on some wire. Uh, this will be kind of hanging off the side of the chamber and that's a dead giveaway. Uh, you can count how many detectors are on a tool just by quickly glancing at it. So first the electrons are generated by the beam specimen interactions as we uh, previously described. And next they may be attracted or repulsed by a grid bias. Uh, this is typically just a conductive mesh, which can be positively or negatively biased. So right here we have grid bias. So for the example of secondary electrons, we would put a, some type of positive bias on here to help pull the electrons over to this out-of-lens detector. After this, uh, we would actually need a scintillator bias, which would ensure that the electrons strike this detector uh, with su sufficient um, velocity or energy. Right after that, what happens is they hit the scintillator. And this is a phosphor-coated surface that fluoresces upon excitation. So, you know, by fluorescing I mean that as once an electron strikes, uh, a photon is emitted on the opposite side of that scintillator. And uh, for every electron, striking, there's a photon generated. The scintillator bias is usually 10 to 15 kilovolts, and again, um, it ensures that the striking electrons have sufficient energy to cause scintillation. Now, the light guide basically just has the job of propagating and containing the photons as they travel towards the photomultiplier. So, after the scintillator, the photons move down the light guide, then they hit our photomultiplier in, uh, cont contained within this photomultiplier tube. The photomultiplier makes use of two phenomena. 
the photoelectric effect, and actually secondary electron emissions. So uh, the first one, the photoelectric effect, is basically the idea or uh, you know, the effect of when photons of sufficient energy strike a metal, they can stimulate an electron emission. So the photons came from the scintillator, they strike uh, metal, uh, kind of little metal flakes within the photomultiplier, and these stimulate electron emission. Then these electrons um, can actually emit more electrons uh, once they strike uh, another metal within the photomultiplier tube. So uh, the net result is kind of this, uh, this cascade effect where every time an electron hits a metal, um, it will generate secondary electrons which will hit a metal and the process continues. So again, the photomultiplier, the way it does that is electrons strike the plate, uh, excuse me, photons strike the plate, uh, produce electrons, then those are multiplied by the <clears throat> secondary emission of, of more electrons. So we have an electron cascade or an electron amplification. So here's a figure that I believe can help um, describe what we're talking about here. The photomultiplier is made of many diodes. This is a series of anodes where each is more positively biased than the last. So a chain of events occurs after the first electron strikes the first dynode. The dynode creates multiple secondary electrons, they strike another dynode, creating more secondary electrons and so on. So we have this electron cascade. The final current will be hundreds of millions of times greater than the input. And this will correspond to some level of brightness which we see on our display. So again, um, just to recap, an electron is you know, let's say a secondary electron is generated um, at our sample surface from the interaction of our incoming beam. That electron is attracted by a grid bias towards the out-of-lens secondary electron detector. Then there's another bias to ensure it has adequate uh, velocity. It strikes a um, excuse me it strikes the scintillator, produces a photon. The photon hits these dynodes, produces secondary electrons. Those produce more secondary electrons. And by the electron cascade, we have an amplified signal now. As an example of a, a type of outer lens detector, um, there's an Everhart Thornley detector. This is the most common out of lens secondary electron detector. So it's positioned some distance, you know, typically about 12 inches away or 14 inches away um, from the sample itself. There'll be a Faraday cage to produce a grid bias. This will surround the lens. You can apply a bias to it. Um, you know, to have a positive bias, that attracts the entire range of secondary electrons. A negative bias could basically push away some of the lower energy, uh, slower moving secondary electrons, and actually allow the detection of some backscattered electrons, depending upon what information you're trying to gather from your sample. Now on to in-lens detectors. We said, again, they are positioned inside the lens. Uh, let's look at this one on the right. This is showing a, a backscatter detector. So in the center, we see our objective lens right here. This is our location of our two in-lens detectors. One is a backscatter, one is a secondary. And this would be perhaps a, a stigmator coil, which allows us to raster across the sample. Uh, way up here is our gun and uh, kind of extraction anode and accelerating anode. We've left out a couple parts. That's okay. So if we look at our secondary electron detector, um, we see that it's actually positioned higher up in the column. And notice the path that the electrons take. 
these electrons are moving uh, very fast, they have very high energies. And it, what's interesting to note is the shape of the path that they take is actually governed by the field in the objective lens. Okay, so they're guided back up through this anode, uh, sorry, through this aperture, which actually happens to be a secondary electron detector, and they go right up through, kind of fan out, and then hit our backscattered electron detector. Now, because secondary electrons are weaker and slower moving, they're actually more warped uh, by the magnetic field within the objective lens. They cross over, and most of them fan out and hit this secondary electron detector. A few of them will go straight up through the middle and can, would continue on and hit our backscatter electron detector. But to prevent that, we can actually put on a little bit of grid bias. And uh, so if we put a little negative grid bias here, it'll prevent these weak secondary electrons from hitting our secondary detector. This grid bias will not block the backscattered electrons. Why? Because these backscattered electrons have much higher energy, and they'll go right through and, and still hit our detector. So again, maybe in a little more detail to clarify, the secondary in-lens detector has a weak magnetic field <clears throat> at the specimen surface. Now that magnetic field is coming from the objective lens. Since they're emitted nearly perpendicular to the surface, they're quickly accelerated up through the objective lens, up the column, and to the detector. Since they're low energy, um, they're easily pulled into the column. The net result is a detection through a wide angle range, and, and we get enhanced uh, topographic contrast. Again, some secondary electrons will pass through this detector, but they will be repelled by a, a backscatter filtering grid. Um, uh, a closer look and things to mention are that the in-lens detectors um, obviously positioned within the lens have high resolutions. Why? Because the secondary electrons can be trapped by that um, objective lens magnetic field. This is only possible because of their extremely low energies. For this to work though, the objective lens has to be extremely close to the sample surface. Okay, Very, very short working distances. We're talking about um, down to two millimeter working distances between your objective lens and your sample in order to have maximum secondary electrons swept up by that magnetic field. Also, some backscattered electrons will be ejected straight up and directly towards that in-lens detector and will contribute a bit to, uh, to that signal, unless we can filter them out by some other means. The backscattered electron detector in lens is also positioned <coughs> right above the in lens detector. Because these electrons have higher energies and are deflected less, they ac actually uh, basically follow this path and go right through the secondary electron detector. Um, so they pass straight up through the column, through the in-lens detector, and then hit the backscatter detector. A filtering grid here will repel any secondary electrons which may have passed through this first in-lens secondary electron detector. Also, this grid can actually, if we want to, <clears throat> be used to also prevent some lower energy backscattered electrons from hitting the detector. Backscattered electrons moving nearly straight up the column provide uh, excellent compositional contrast. And uh, we can recall that they resulted, or they came from, the elastic collision with the surface. <clears throat> that kind of sling slingshot effect uh, due, the due to the coulombic forces of the uh, nuclei in your sample results in that high energy um, velocity electrons traveling straight back up the column. There can actually also be a backscattered electron detector, which is can be called on-lens. 
This is termed an angle selective backscatter detector. So it's actually located not in but on the lens. It's actually right on the front of the objective lens. Uh, the reason we have this is if some of your backscattered electrons actually are emitted at uh, angles other than perpendicular, then we can still detect them if we have them on the bottom of this objective lens. So this enables backscattered imaging with very short working distances and we won't kind of miss any of the signals being produced by our sample and beam specimen interaction. Um, a general note on detectors. To determine the position of a detector relative to a sample, this is how you do it. If you're looking at your, at your image and your image appears to be lit from one side, and remember your image will be black and white and grayscale values, but typically it'll appear to be lit from one side and that side from which it appears to be lit is the side where your detector, your out of lens detector is placed. So that's a cool trick for figuring out the location of your detector relative to your sample image. And also regardless of the detector position, the viewer's line of sight and therefore the image on the screen will be as if you were standing directly above the gun column and looking down the column along the path of incident electrons. Now, let's compare uh, two types of secondary electron detectors. On the left is an image taken with an in-lens secondary electron detector. On the right is one taken with an out-of-lens secondary electron detector, an Everhart Thornley detector. On the left we see that there are sharper edges, more clearly defined details, and overall it's a higher resolution image at this higher magnification. However, on the right, we actually get more topographic contrast, so it looks more, uh, better, more 3D and, and better shading. And we also have a greater depth of focus, so we can have more of the image um, kind of highs and lows in a, in a larger field all in focus at the same time. So depending upon what you like, uh, you need to choose your detectors appropriately. Now let's talk about some of the challenges in uh, acquiring an image. First of all, there's that of contamination. When the beam interacts with residual gases, hydrocarbons, or any non-conductive areas of a sample, it will, it will result in contamination. And secondary electron imaging is actually the most vulnerable to the effects of contamination due to their low energies. Uh, in this picture, this is a common thing you'll see uh, when your samples become contaminated. You'll see a little square appear. And this little square is actually due to where you were looking previously. So, so uh, you know, let's say we were looking at this image, we were a little bit further zoomed in, so our raster pattern was was like so, and it produced this little contamination area here. Now if you zoom out, uh, then you'll see the contaminated area. Of course, if we sat here for a while, this area would, would soon become contaminated as well. To avoid this contamination, uh, you can start by ensuring that the specimen is clean. Um, you can also decrease the probe current. Um, you can avoid high magnification unless absolutely necessary because the higher the magnification the smaller raster area and therefore the more time an electron beam is spending on a given area. Also you could uh, a useful trick is to align the microscope on an area that you're not going to use for your final imaging. In other words you practice. So you go to an area that you're not too interested in you adjust everything your focus your stigmation your working distance etc. your wobble and then when everything is nice and ready to go you quickly move to the sample that you're interested in the, the area, area you're interested in and uh, maybe slow down your scan speed and, and take an image.
Charging is another common uh, issue in trying to image a sample. This occurs whenever the material cannot effectively conduct the beam energy imparted to it. So if you have non-conductors or semiconductors, you're oftentimes going to be uh, trying to work around the problem of charging. Um, basically what happens is you have so many electrons coming down in your beam that you actually want most of them to be grounded out. So to continue to pass through the sample uh, down below to the metal stage and, and go to ground. If this doesn't occur, you actually have too many electrons present and it, you kind of get a, a, a force field of electrons build up on your surface. Okay. The result is that um, those electrons all built up on your surface will make the image appear to glow or can lead to streaking, image streaking and distortion. Okay. The electrons present on your image will artificially enhance um, and cause unintentional beam deflection. So to prevent charging, you need to prevent a grounding path from the sample to the metal stage below. You can do that in a couple of different ways. You can use conductive paint, you can use conductive tape. If you have to, you can coat non-conductive samples with a thin uh, film of conductive material, such as gold. So you could sputter down, say, five nanometers of gold, and, and this would help out significantly. Also, um, by applying that thin film, it dramatically increases secondary electron yield and therefore it actually gives you higher resolution. Other strateg strategies to reduce charging include reducing the probe current, lowering the accelerating voltage, so that obviously if you do these two, you'll have less electrons hitting the sample uh, you know, per given time, so you have less charging. You can tilt the specimen to find the best ratio of incident electrons and electrons that are allowed to kind of pass by the sample. And uh, a little bit more sophisticated technique you could try is conductivity testing. This is where you would focus on one area at high magnification for a few seconds, then reduce the magnification and observe the sample. If there's a bright square, that means there's negative charging, so you should lower the voltage. If there's a dark square, which quickly disappears, it means that um, there's positive charging occurring and you should actually raise the voltage a bit. And lastly, here are some examples of specimen damage uh, due to the interaction with the electron beam. Loss of electron beam energy in the specimen occurs mostly via heat generated at the point of irradiation. Polymers, biologicals, and other non-conductors are easily damaged due to low heat conductivity. So strategies uh, to avoid specimen damage are very similar to strategy, strategies to avoid charging. Uh, decrease accelerating voltage and or aperture size, shorten the exposure time, apply a thin metal coating, avoid unnecessary high mag, and again, as we said, align the microscope on an area that you're not going to use for final imaging. If we look here, this is at 0.5 kV, 30 micron aperture. Here we're trying to get a little higher kV, um, but we reduce the aperture. And you know, if we st stay at that high kV and large aperture, we have the most uh, you know, substantial charging and distortion of our features. So this is the truest representation of our features, and you can see the result of, uh, of charging. As we, as we proceed to the left. Um, this looks kind of crazy, but this would be a chart uh, for mastering the tool. If you want to consider all your options and the effects on these different signals or, 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 or types of information you're trying to gather, and this is kind of how it would break down as far as what happens if you change um, the strength of your condenser lens, um, the, the voltage, your accelerating voltage, your working distance, your objective aperture size. How do all these variables affect spot size, um, secondary electron signal, resolution, depth of field, topography? So these are all things really that um, you know, uh, a well-practiced user
has to think about when they're investigating a sample with an FESCM. Approaching the end of our talk here, but one thing to point out is that we can do signal mixing. Um, since it's not necessary to, to change any settings when switching between detectors, we can easily combine, say, in-lens and um, secondary electron and in-lens backscattered electrons or out-of-lens secondary electrons and on-lens backscattered signals. We can continuously mix these to provide uh, both topographic and compositional contrast. So if we look at an example here, this is an image just taken with an in-lens secondary electron detector. But then we apply a backscatter electron detector. And of course, we know the backscatter will give us compositional contrast. So now we can see these bright areas where the heavier elements are uh, present. And darker areas would be uh, uh, lighter elements. But the great thing about mixing is you can, you know, you can go from 0% to 100% uh, mixing and it allows you to gauge how much of each uh, signal you want to be present in your image. So it allows you to get the most, best of both worlds. You have the enhanced topographic uh, contrast and high resolution of inlands, but then also the uh, compositional contrast of your backscatter electron detector.